Hi guys, it's Mr. Y. Today we're going to be continuing our talk about ecosystems and some of their complex interactions. Uh, you should be watching this lecture after you've already watched the lecture concerning um, food chains, food webs, and biomass pyramid, pyramids, numbers, and all that other stuff. This is a slight extension upon that material, so make sure if you haven't watched that other video yet, you go back and rewatch that and make sure you're good on that before you come here. So I'm going to start this lecture off with a relatively simple question. Looking at these two pictures here on the left, on the right, you have two ecosystems, ecosystem B and ecosystem A. And within each ecosystem, there's four different species of trees. There's species A, B, C, and D. And again, A, uh, B, C, and D over here. And the question is simply, which ecosystem would you argue, either ecosystem A or B, is more healthy. And what you're seeing down here in the numbers are the relative percentages of each ecosystem's populations for that different number of species. So which ecosystem is it that you think is actually more healthy based upon these images and these percentages here? So in asking which ecosystem is more healthy, we also want to ask which ecosystem is more diverse, which one has more species. And this table, which actually has a slight error to it, should be for these percentages, this is B and this side is A, for those two pictures we saw on the last slide. Uh, they show the relative percentage here for each ecosystem. So on the B side, on the again, the prior picture, about 80% you had one species, 10% you had a third, and then 5% for the remaining two. For the A side, you had about a pretty equal distribution of 25% for each species. And so what I'm really trying to drive home is this connection between how diverse an ecosystem is and its overall health as we define it in biology. So the reason why a ecosystem's health is directly correlated to its level of diversity of species is because when you have ecosystems or even just communities, remember communities are just uh, groups of populations of different species with higher diversity rates, uh, they tend to be more productive in terms of how much biomass they can support overall. Remember biomass from biomass pyramids. They tend to be more stable in this productivity, meaning they don't change their productivity from year to year. They're better able to withstand stresses, meaning things like fires, floods, volcanic eruptions, anything that would cause ecological damage, uh, where you have species diversity, they tend to recover much faster where, instead of areas where there's just a monoculture of one or two or three species. They also tend to be more resistant to not only invasive species, but also to viruses as well. Um, farmers can tell you this, they tend to try not to grow too much in monoculture because if a single virus comes by, it can wipe out their entire crop. Well, if you have growing more than one crop, well, then you have more possible income. But it's the same thing in ecosystems. Viruses won't be as devastating to an ecosystem or a community where you have lots of diversity. And when you're talking about invasive species, invasive species have a harder time becoming established, becoming able to sustain themselves in an area where there's lots of different species working together, as opposed to a monoculture where they can exploit usually some um, problem with the monoculture ecosystem. So diversity is connected to an ecosystem's health in terms of how we judge it to be healthy or not. And so the big takeaway, healthier ecosystems are those ecosystems that tend to have a greater diversity of species. Now we summarize this by saying they have greater biodiversity. That's what we mean by biodiversity, greater numbers of different species. So larger biodiversity ecosystems are tend to be thought of as being more healthier because they have all these advantages compared to an ecosystem that has very few species. Now, one of the reasons I'm bringing this up is because back in the 1960s, there was an experiment done by a gentleman named Payne. And basically what he found was he worked in the coastal regions off of um, Oregon and Washington. And he found that there was an ecosystem in marine tidal pools just off of the shoreline. These are pools that fill up with seawater, but they don't typically flood in or out too often. And he found that in this ecosystem, there was a top predator, a starfish, this guy here. Uh, here. Pisasterus, I'm going to say this right, 
orcaraceus. It's a starfish, and it preys on just about everything below it, and it has no natural predators of its own. Well, what he did is he would find these tidal pools, and he wondered what would happen if he took out every starfish from a single pool. What would happen to the species biodiversity within that pool? And so he literally spent four, five, six years doing nothing but pulling out starfish from specific pools and making sure only starfish got pulled out and that everything else remained just to see how it affected the overall populations that remained in those tidal pools. It turned out when he did this, the main prey of these guys, the mussels, began to dominate the rest of the other species. That is to say, it pushed out, it outcompeted every other species that was normally there. It drove out most of the other species. And so this entire ecosystem became monoculturized. The urchin population basically annihilated and destroyed the rest of the ecosystem because it had no predator population to keep it in check. And so, again, these are the tidal pool type situations where pain was working. He did this with many other tidal pools where he pulled out many other species from this food web uh, that was there in these tidal pools. And it was only when he pulled out these starfish, these top level predators, that he saw this effect that you see down here in this graph. When you had a control where, you know, this is a tidal pool where nothing was changed. This is a control group. Nothing was changed. You can see the number of species present sat around somewhere between 16 to 18 by the end here. And yet when he looked at the pools where he had purposely removed the starfish from starting around 1963 to 1965, he saw the number of species drop very, very quickly to where there was only two, three species left. The entire ecosystem, its biodiversity collapsed because again, those mussels began basically outcompeting everything else that remained and there was nothing to keep them in check. They had no predators feeding on them. And again, these results were really radical at the time because it was nobody thought that if you just removed one species, so many other species would be affected in this way. And this kind of goes back to our discussion of not just food chains, but food webs and um, uh, energy pyramids as well. And so what Payne did next is he thought that because there were these species that he found that you could remove from an ecosystem that would have such a detrimental impact to the ecosystem when they were removed, he thought of something anybody in history knows of. He thought of actually a piece of architecture. He thought of an arch. Now anybody who studied um, ancient Rome knows that Romans used the arch all the time in much of their construction, so I've put several examples up here. And whether it was a tunnel, like over here, or a huge coliseum, or a water canal, or a monument, or a palace, or a pedestrian bridge, one of the key features of these arches is always this center area here what Payne called, or what's known as, excuse me, the keystone. The keystone is vital in the construction of the arch because it's putting all the weight from all the sides here. And the weight itself is actually being pushed to the sides. So the weight doesn't come down, it actually goes this way here and this way here. But the keystone is literally the key. If the keystone is in any way damaged or destroyed or removed, the entire arch falls down. The entire weight of this system collapses upon itself because without that stone there, there's nothing to keep the arch in place. And that's what Payne thought of when he thought of these starfish. He thought of these species as holding everything else in the ecosystem in place to prevent it from collapsing upon itself if it was ever removed the term keystone species, species that have a great impact on the diversity, the biodiversity in their ecosystem, especially you see this if they are removed for some reason, if they go extinct, if they're hunted out. And he first found this in what we call predator populations. So um, here's another example of a keystone species. These are hammerhead sharks, which feed upon, get the highlighter here, which feed upon uh, the cow nose rays, these guys right here. And the cow nose rays, of course, will be predators to other things such as clams, oysters, and scallops. Well, when we overhunted um, hammerhead populations, the cow nose rays how had, now had no predators to keep their population low, so their numbers went up. But as their numbers went up, the number of their prey species down here, put this in blue so it's easier, decrease. And soon we had major issues finding scallops for our own purposes. So by overhunting hammerheads, we'd actually hurt ourselves in terms of our um, 
being able to get scallops for our own consumption, the entire ecosystem has started to collapse because it cascaded down upon itself. The keystone, the hammerhead, had been removed to help keep the ecosystem healthy. And so that's just one example, but there's going to be many more you guys are going to see through the course of this lecture and its associated videos. Another one, um, salmon. Turns out salmon are a huge keystone species, even though they're not necessarily a top level predator. The salmon, let me get this out of the way here, the salmon actually bring nutrients upstream, they're food for lots of different things, and everything that the salmon get into in terms of their trip upstream from the oceans when they come to breed ends up being beneficial to the entire ecosystem upon which these rivers uh, run through. And so salmon are another example of keystone species, but keystone species that are not necessarily top predators. That took a while for scientists to figure out. So. Keystone species exert this huge control over the ecosystems, the communities that they live in, because of all the strong interactions they have within their food web. Um, their impact is much, much, much higher than you would suspect from their general biomass. And if a keystone species is removed, it has what we call a trophic cascade. That's how Payne described it. All the connections that are here begin to fail and the entire ecosystem can start to collapse down upon itself. It's not a pretty thing and what we've discovered is that when keystone species are removed this is bad but it can actually be reversed to some extent. You can actually reintroduce keystone species in some cases and get the ecosystem to start to reestablish itself. So understanding this concept was huge to conservationists because they figured out, oh, you don't have to protect every species within an ecosystem if you just protect a few of the keystones, it helps the rest of the ecosystem stay supported. It was a major, major improvement over conservation of the uh, prior time. And again, this was done in the late 1960s, 1970s. Another one that Payne helped discover in terms of keystone species was sea otters. Uh, sea otters were often hunted for their fur, and it turns out when they were eliminated from areas, uh, namely up towards Russia and Alaska, it caused whole cascades of ecosystems to collapse in on itself. So you had an ecosystem like this with lots of biodiversity here on the left side. We have sea, sea otters, starfish that they feed on, large crabs that they feed on, large fist and octopus that they feed on, sea urchins. All these things were prey for the sea otters, but when you eliminated the sea otters due to overhunting for their fur, the entire ecosystem began to collapse to where all you had left were much fewer species, and all these other species here, actually, let me do that the other way, all these other species here and here and here and here, all their numbers began to drop because there was such a huge impact by removing the sea otters. And when they figured out later, after lots of conservation effort, that they could reintroduce sea otters to certain areas, the ecosystems would actually start to reassert themselves. You'd get more diversity. And so that's why keystone species are important. They themselves help support so many different things, both directly and indirectly. That's what makes them crucial. And so to help illustrate this, I actually have two associated videos with this lecture. They're embedded in links here, and there's five different ways you can get to the link, so there's no excuse for not being able to see it. Um, they're both about keystone species and how they affect the environment, but especially the first one, it's a bit longer, but it talks about Payne's discovery. You can um, download this lecture via my website and then just uh, open it up and click the links, or you could just directly type this in. All the ways to get into the videos are right here. So again, no excuses for not being able to watch them, but you're required to watch at least these two. Again, they're both on YouTube. Uh, two other optional videos that I'll show you uh, brief previews of here in a second are down here. So make sure you watch at least these two and take notes as you need to. There'll be a few terms I think that'll come up there, like the green world hypothesis and uh, trophic cascade. So the first video, again, the link's here. It's actually embedded in this PowerPoint. So if you just download the PowerPoint on your computer and hit play, it'll play for you. Um, the, sec the second video here uh, is a bit shorter, but it talks about different examples of keystone species and again, Take notes as you need to, but it's really just so you get a better idea of what they are and their impact on ecosystems.
here's the two optional videos again these are just examples of keystone species and how they've changed or how we think they've changed the ecosystems in which they inhabit again both videos are embedded the links are right here you could also just copy and paste the url or directly type in this url without having to download anything as long as you have internet so make sure you watch at least the first two required videos um, to round out your knowledge of keystone species and, and at least some examples and why they are important in things like conservation and in ecosystems and ecology in general.